morning, everyone. Nice to see everybody. We'll get started in maybe two minutes or so. And remember, it's uh, just, uh, it can be a really beautiful practice just to take our time, sense into the community that we're sitting with so that we're not, our practice isn't somehow limited because we're not meeting in person at Common Ground. Um, so we have to do that work of sensing into the community that's out there. Look around, see our, our faces. <laughs> and it's also a nice time if uh, you feel motivated just to put something in the chat. And it's totally okay for people to have their videos off, of course. But if you do want to have it on, this is a nice time to have it on as people are perusing and just having that sense of community, that sense of lineage, right? There are people that have the good fortune to be able to be reflective in their life and reflective about what's most important. And uh, we can be grateful we're not on our own to figure out what to do with this human life. I'm going to put in the chat one more time the uh, five remembrances if people didn't see that. And that's how we'll begin today, reflecting on these. And in particular, let the words land in our heart from the last two, number four and five. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. This isn't meant to kind of be a bummer. It's really, it begs the question, well, where, where is happiness? Where is real safety in a world where everything beloved will become otherwise? What is the refuge? And then um, I'll talk a little bit in the talk after the sit about karma today. And uh, in this world of karma, where we're always setting things in motion based on how we're relating to the present. And so in a very real way, what we're experiencing right now, the quality of the mind, heart, body, it can only have arisen out of past causes and present moment causes. So in a very real way, the experience we're having now is the fruit of what was left over from the past. It isn't, you know, karma isn't a teaching that we use to blame ourselves. Oh, I'm at fault because how it is for me right now is not nice. So I must have been a bad person back there. That's a very unuseful and simplistic and not true understanding of karma. But what this is right now that we're experiencing, well, it can only have arisen from the causes and conditions that were in motion, right? That's called the past. The past doesn't exist except for what's reverberating now. And even how I'm relating to rever what's reverberating now is affected by what was set in motion in the past, right? So let's do this chant. Most of you know <clears throat> the word kama is also the same as the Sanskrit word karma, which means actions done with intention, including a thought done intentionally is also a karmic action in the sense of it leaves an impression. Okay, so we're gonna do the five subjects for frequent recollection now. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. 
I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma, whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. Thus we should frequently recollect. And we'll take our time now just to settle, listen to the body, see what is an appropriate posture for the meditation time for yourself. Knowing, of course, that the bodily posture won't be perfect. We won't be most likely perfectly comfortable. And that's okay. It just needs to be good enough to support this intention to be awake in this balanced way, alert and relaxed. And it's really okay for the heart to be interested in being comfortable, to be interested in being safe, to be interested in experiencing pleasure. We don't need to get rid of that habit to want to feel good. We just want to integrate that basic habit of wanting to feel good with a deeper and deeper wisdom that appreciates what kinds of pleasures are worthy of seeking, worthy of orienting around, and what sorts of pleasures are not, end up not being very satisfying. And a simple example of this that is very obvious for many of us at the beginning of a sitting time is this effort to seek a comfortable sitting posture. And we could spend the entire 35 minutes tweaking our sitting posture, looking for that perfect comfort. And with every little tweak, we might get a little pleasure, but we'd also be conditioning this habit to be seeking a better sitting posture, which is stressful. So there's also the pleasure of being content with the sensations of the body as they already are. It's a more peaceful pleasure to not need the sensations, the quality of the body sitting to be different than it is right now. So just contemplate that as we settle, contemplate the possibility of being content with the quality of the body, the qualities here physically in the body now. We're not pretending they're different or better than they are. We're just exploring whether the heart can be content, whether the heart is willing to allow the body to be the way it is and allow the breath to be the way it is, allowing the temperature to be the way that it is 
and even the more subtle emotional qualities that might be here in our heart, allowing these feelings in the heart, emotional feelings in the heart to be the way they are, being content with these conditions because it's skillful, it's pleasurable to be content. It's a more subtle but more satisfying pleasure, the pleasure of the heart that doesn't need this moment to be different, better. And if you, your mind, heart needs some support, you could even with each easy exhalation, just repeat a word like contentedness or ease as in ease with these conditions. Just as a little opening, a little reminder of this possibility that the heart can be at ease with these conditions as they are. Or the word allowing, allowing the body, allowing the heart to be the way it is. So we're simply keeping contentedness in mind as a meditation subject for a few minutes now. This is good practice to be meditating on a theme, the theme of contentedness with these conditions, the heart mind being at ease with the conditions that are here and now. So we're keeping this theme in mind and it's definitely okay if you need to use some strategic thoughts to direct the mind back to this particular theme of contentment, contentedness with these conditions that are here. And of course, we'll lose the theme, get distracted, that's okay. Just acknowledging when you catch that the mind is distracted, 
Notice any underlying feeling that goes with the distraction. Oh, it feels like this now. And then reestablish this contemplation on contentedness. And remember you can experiment using a meditation word to help to keep it in mind. And remember to notice the pleasure in contentment, in the ease with conditions. This ease of contentedness will mature into a more profound happiness of dispassion, the heart not dependent on anything or much of anything.
and in a very ordinary way, sensing the heart, the mind that isn't so limited by fear, by desire, by fixed ideas. Or we could say recognizing the heart beyond limitations. Of course, it's not about an idea. It's really more directly, immediately sensing the nature of the mind and heart.
So we're practicing this particular contemplation of noticing, remembering to notice the pleasure of being content with the conditions of the body and the mind. And then of course, we'll also have to practice with whatever gets in the way, whatever disturbance, distraction might arise. And notice the tendency to get entangled and to react and to wanna fix or wanna control. But if you can feel the reverberation of contentment, maybe be content, spacious with the distraction itself, knowing that like everything else, it will arise and it will pass away on its own. And you can even, if you need to language it, say something like, oh yeah, sometimes distractions arise like this. It just feels like this now. Can this be okay that this distraction has arisen? Yeah, yeah, like everything it comes and goes. We can even be dispassionate about these tendencies of the thinking mind to plan and worry. Does it mean we're allowing the mind to get seduced and lost in thought? We're not immediately thinking we've got to go do something because a thought, a reaction has arisen. Maybe things will cease on their own.
So it's really helpful for us to take this time to have a clearer, more intimate sense of the quality, the happiness of dispassion and contentment so that the heart really knows this experience well and really learns how to appreciate this more resonant kind of happiness of contentment, ease and dispassion. The heart that doesn't need things to be different. Doesn't mean the heart doesn't care. It just means the heart is realizing the peace, the resonant peace of contentment. It knows this as an option. So instead of looking at our ideas of what we want, what we don't like, we're choosing to look at here and now that experience of feeling whole, feeling stable, feeling inclusive, the heart including everything and the pleasure that comes in that stability of present moment awareness and the contentedness and the ease and dispassion. This is an inner pleasure actually that we can bank on, we can count on it. It's just a matter of orienting the heart in this way, away from our wants and our fears and taking some time to have a more inclusive, relaxed, generous connection with the present moment and feel, recognize that felt sense of contentment and ease, the happiness and pleasure of that and let it mature into a more full dispassion the heart not dependent on anything. So take a little time, adjust your body. So it's nice to be with everybody this morning here at our virtual common ground. I think I know many of you, most of you, but some of you may be new. So I'm Mark Nunberg. Um, along with Shelley Graff, we're the two staff Dharma teachers at Common Ground Meditation Center. And uh, I'm gonna be going on retreat starting late tomorrow afternoon, but I'm here 
now and I'll be back then on Sunday, December, I believe it's the 20th. And uh, just a little reminder that if you'd like to stay on at 1145 Minnesota time, Nancy Bowler is here today and she'll help organize the community into small groups that you could just chat about the discussion that we're having that I'll be bringing up. So those meetings are usually 15 to 20 minutes, three to four people, something like that. So if you've got some time and wanna connect and build some relationships and discuss the practice, then just stay right here at the Zoom room after we finish at 1145. So I've been finishing now the last couple of weeks, this series of talks on the Buddhist teachings on impermanence and really more generally the path of awakening. And uh, the basic, you know, situation we're in is the mind is misperceiving, misunderstanding this experience of contact, of experience. And so then relates to our moment to moment experience, this activity of the body and mind with greed, hatred, and delusion. Sometimes it, the greed, hatred, and delusion is very obvious, but just as we all know, most of the time we may be greedy, we may be aversive or fearful, we may be distracted or in denial, but doesn't mean we'll know it, right? So that's sort of the nature of greed, hatred, and delusion as animating forces. And remember, it's not always like full rage as anger or full lust as greed or full denial as delusion, right? They're very subtle manifestations of greed, hatred, and delusion, but they're mostly the animating forces of our life. Even when we're doing wholesome, so-called wholesome stuff, we're taking care of somebody, but doesn't mean that that activity isn't affected by greed or affected by fear. Your suffering is bothering me, so I'm gonna really help you because it's irritating me that you're suffering, right? Now we don't say that out loud, hopefully, and we often don't even recognize it internally, but that doesn't mean that that sort of activity of taking care of somebody isn't affected by aversion. I mean, something simple like when you feed your dog, you may love your dog, you may really appreciate that you have food to feed your dog, but you still might be irritated that you have to feed your dog, right? And in a sense, hate that you have this obligation or that you have to fulfill this obligation now because the dog won't leave you alone, right? So, so much of our ordinary activity in life is really contaminated. And it's really our job as we stabilize present moment awareness to realize how oppressive it is for us to be living our life where it's mostly animated, like the motivating force of action of doing, including the doing of thinking. So not just outward doing, but even our thoughts or words that most of that is animated by greed, hatred and delusion. And we can recognize it because it hurts. It's oppressive when, but because, you know, because we're living in this oppressive way, oppressed way, we don't realize how oppressive it is. <laughs> when we're hurting, we don't necessarily realize it's hurting because we've been hurting a long time. And it's sort of like the, the new normal hurting, being oppressed by greed, hatred, and delusion. So it doesn't stand out. One of the real benefits of being able to touch into moments and then over time more uh, longer periods of time of contentment is that then the oppressiveness of greed, hatred, and delusion, it really starts to stand out when we know the feeling of contentment and that deeper flavor of the heart, the dispassion, which we have to have some humility. We may not really fully yet understand what dispassion is, but it's a very beautiful and enlivening state of happiness. And when the heart is in that place of not needing, not fearing, being dispassionate, being having some space from greed, hatred, and delusion, then greed, hatred, and delusion really stand out 
So when it reemerges because of, you know, habit or something triggers it, boy, it really stands out. Here's a fun passage from one of the suttas, the discourses, and this involves um, some younger monastics at the time of the Buddha. And they were doing their practice. And then Mara shows up. Now, a lot of you know, but Mara is sort of the per personification, both internally, but also in a sense, externally, the personification of ignorance and greed, hatred, and delusion, sort of like the seductress that causes the mind to go back to its craving ways. It's relating in ways that are harmful and hurtful. So Mara uh, arises for these young monks doing their best and says to them, do not abandon what is visible here and now and run off to distance, distant things, right? So Mara's trying to trick them. Like, uh, don't abandon what's visible here and now. Like, there are sense experiences here and now. You can go find somebody to have sex with, or you can go find a delicious food to eat, or you can, you know, but there are any number of ways for you to pursue a pleasant experience. And, and he said, don't avoid these really nice things you can get right now and pursue something that's far away, like awakening, Nibbana, right? And the monks, they had some wisdom. They said back to their own, you know, ignorance, we have abandoned what is distant and run toward what is visible here and now. The Buddha has said, worldly pleasures are distant and of uncertain result, right? They might look enticing and sparkling and like they're gonna deliver, but we never really get the satisfaction we think we're gonna get when we go to the refrigerator or we search the internet for something entertaining. We get just enough to keep us hooked, but never ever are we fully satisfied by our food, by our sense experiences, whatever it might be. The Buddha has said that worldly pleasures are distant of uncertain result, produce much suffering and despair and have continual disappointment. But this Dhamma, or the truth, like we were reflecting on contentedness, but this Dhamma is visible here and now, immediate in result, inviting one to come and see, guiding one onward, capable of being experienced by the wise. Now you might not know that, but basically what they repeated to themselves when confronted with you know, this bad habit saying, hey, screw this meditation stuff. Let's go back into town and play in the delights of the world whatever that might be for each of them. And what they said back is, no, there's something here and now, visible here and now. And this is the, like I said, the definition of Dhamma, not the more sort of usual translation of Dhamma as the teachings of the Buddha, but the deeper meaning of Dhamma, which is the underlying truth, that it's visible here and now, right? That it's immediate, and result, it invites one to come and see. It draws the heart in. The heart senses when we're opening, like maybe you felt it, it's subtle. So it takes some reorientation of the mind, which is generally oriented towards what's gross. Like the pleasure of eating something we'd like to eat, that's a gross, dense experience. So, it, and we're oriented that way, so it gets our attention. But the more subtle pleasure of contentedness and dispassion, we're, it's almost like we're, the mind isn't used to receiving that frequency, attuning to that frequency. Oh yeah, this, this feels good. This actually is more satisfying than those gross pleasures. Right, it's a little, little bit like that with food, you know, um, you know, nachos with the cheese you get out of a jar or something like that, you know, that has its own pleasure associated with it for some people. But you know, there are other 
foods that are much more refined and subtle that we can develop a taste for. And that might end up being much more satisfying than foods that are like really salty or really sweet or really sour and kind of hit you with a punch. And you, you have that momentary sense, oh, I'm alive because my mouth is on fire or, you know, it's just like this strong flavor. But we can learn to let go of the mind's fixation on intense and gross sense experiences and become more attuned to refined experiences. And even in this movement from sense experience to the pleasure of the mind that doesn't want, right? There's the happiness of getting what we want. And then there's a more refined happiness of not wanting. That's contentment, right? But like how often in our life have we been encouraged to get to know the happiness of not wanting? And immediately, like, look at what comes to our minds when you hear me say the happiness of not wanting. It's like we're sure the Buddha is trying to trick us into some desert of austerity, you know, where we don't get anything. And uh, at least I won't be betrayed when good stuff goes away, but I'm going to be destined to forever live in that desert where nothing interesting happens, nothing intensely pleasurable happens. And it's, boy, it's going to be boring and it's going to be bad, but at least good things won't go away. I mean, that's, that's called nihilism, you know, where we think, oh, I'm a human being that appreciates warmth when I'm cold and coolness when I'm hot and sometimes sweet and sometimes sour and human affection. And, but I'm not going to give myself anything. And the Buddha, like, you know, in terms of, his practice history, he checked out these ascetic practices where he let go of a lot of these ordinary pleasures and saw it and basically taught that is a dead end. Indulging, thinking that sense pleasures are going to deliver any kind of resonant happiness. It's not true. Check it out if you don't believe the Buddha. And then thinking that rejecting sense pleasure goes somewhere, lasting, satisfying doesn't work so he rejected both indulging seeking a light of life of comfort but he also rejected seeking a life where the mind is rejecting ordinary sense pleasures so when good food came his way he would receive it and he would eat as much as the body needed to feel good to be healthy someone built them you know a nice hut to sleep in, he would sleep in it. If no one built him a nice hut, you know, the monks and nuns would just sleep under the trees. So let me just say that one more time. This is the monk's reply when their own fear about um, orienting toward the happiness of contentment and dispassion, right? Of course, doubt is going to arise because there's so much history embedded in our hearts, you know, these habits of seeking safety and, and uh, pleasure through sense experience, that's a deep groove in our heart. So when we experiment, like you go on a Buddhist retreat for a weekend um, or whatever, like here, you know, on retreat, I don't really eat much food past midday. I might have a little piece of fruit or something like that. Um, but that's a long stretch, you know, from one o'clock until breakfast the next morning to basically not take substantial food. And I just do that as a training. You don't have to do that when you're on retreat. Or, you know, we don't talk very much when we're on retreat. You know, functional speech around preparing the food, things like that. But otherwise, we're not chatting with each other. And, you know, we just simplify our life. And, and of course, my heart is drawn to things that are interesting. I would love to watch a movie or do this or do that when I'm on retreat. But we look at, that's like Mara calling. 
oh, why are you seeking something far off in the distance, the happiness of dispassion, the happiness of Nibbana, when on your phone, you could watch pretty much any movie ever made on your phone, which is 10 feet away from you, you know, or in that fridge, you know, you could find probably something you want to eat or whatever it might be. You, you've got a car here. You could get in the car and drive home. And then in the city, you can find anything, <laughs> assuming you can pay for it. So Mara will call and will try to seduce us. Why are you here on retreat seeking some pleasure that seems so far away, right? The idea of Nibbana, we hear this teachings on awakening, the happiness of non-attachment, realizing the heart free from grasping, right? This is how we talk about it sometimes in the early Buddhist tradition. And it can seem far away. Why not just do something you know is gonna make you happy right now? You know, go watch some movie, but first get some chips and some of that cheese in a jar and whatever else you like, <laughs> you know? For me, it would be popcorn with a half a stick of butter. <laughs> and a little cayenne, right? And a little nutritional yeast and salt. But we each have our own little sort of sense treat that always looks like, oh yeah, if only, then I'd be happy. But I tell you, it isn't that far through the bowl of popcorn before it's like, yeah, I'm going to finish it, but it's not really making me happy anymore. And in fact, the interesting thing you'll notice, and I'm sure a lot of you have noticed this, is we're actually, in a funny way, the mind is more interested in the desiring, the popcorn in this example, than actually the pleasure of chewing and tasting and swallowing it. It's just the whole idea of I'm going to have what I want. That idea is quite seductive and juicy in a funny way, more than the actual experience of getting. This is true. Um, not always, but often with sexual interactions, right? The idea of a sexual encounter is often much more impactful on the heart than a sexual encounter or a vacation and the planning and the anticipation versus actually sitting there on the beach and thinking, now what? <laughs> oh, I'll order another drink, you know, now what? Oh, I'll go to the store and look for an interesting trashy novel. Now what? <laughs> I'll have another drink, you know? So, but the idea of the vacation and how it's going to solve my problems, that's very seductive. That's, it, it has a real impact in the heart. Another passage from the the early texts, whoso has turned to renunciation, turned to dispassion of the mind, is filled with an all-embracing love and freed from thirsting after life. And this is often how the Buddha talks about our life, our mind, when it's animated by greed, hatred, and delusion. It's like the mind is trying to feed its hunger or quench its thirst by consuming experience. So I'm, now this should sound familiar to us. I'm looking for possible experiences I can have with the idea that I'm going to feed something. There's a somebody who's hungry or thirsty who needs to feed on experience. And actually the word tanha which usually gets translated as clinging, craving, clinging, is it's uh, it, the same as the word thirst, thirsting, and we're thirsty. So there's that burning. So the Buddha says that, uh, you know, the, the way out of this entanglement, we're tangled in an entanglement. And he uses the image like a whirlpool, the samsara 
whirlpool. There's a feedback mechanism where I see sense experience, which is really the mind's interpretation of sense experience. So when I think about what's in the fridge or actually touch or see what's in the fridge or even put in my mouth, even when I'm eating something, it's as much about my thought about what I'm eating and my thought about whether I like it or not than the actual direct, immediate experience of taste, right? So it's always this interaction of name and form. That's what we, the phrase we use in early Buddhism, <clears throat> form being the sort of contact through the five senses and nama, name, is just like our, the mind's um, perceiving and the feeling that comes up with the perception and the contact and all the mental formations that are added to that experience, there's always this stance between name and form and consciousness. And, it, and the image is like a whirlpool, which has its own integrity. Some of you were on the day long retreat yesterday, we talked about how um, believable these little self-centered dramas are, these samsaric spinning circles. And when we're in one of these little planning dramas or comparing mind dramas, or if only I have this, then I'll be happy drama. If only I get rid of this, then I'll be happy drama. These are these little vortex, these little whirlpools. And when we're there, where the mind is in a way transfixed, held by that drama, that's our world. And we always think in that world of spinning, if I, it's uncomfortable, there's stress to thirsting, to being hungry, right? So even when I'm desiring, we don't realize, because on the surface, it's a little juicy. Oh yeah, when I get that bowl of popcorn, that's gonna feel so good. But actually the state of desiring, if we look at it in a balanced way is stressful because I don't have that popcorn yet. And it's only when I get it, will I feel good, right? So there's this sort of burning, the burning of lust, the grip of hate, the net of delusion, distraction. That's a phrase from the Dhammapada, a really famous, just to talk about these animating forces of greed, hatred, delusion, greed as a burning, hate as a grip in the heart and delusion, distraction, denial as a net confusing, illusory net that catches us. And we're in that vortex and we don't know we're in the vortex. And in the vortex, the only thing we know to get us out of this stressful feeling of desiring, craving, and being identified with the craving is to get something. But that's actually what fuels the spinning of desiring, right, of craving. It keeps the whirlpool, the samsaric whirlpool going. Samsara just means cycles of suffering, stressful cycling, right? And that is the Buddha's description of us ordinary human beings. Some of our samsaric cycling is less intense, less suffering. We call those people, people with good fortune. Some of the samsaric cycling is really overwhelming. And we say those are people who don't have good fortune and have one bad thing after another. That even people who have angelic conditions, you know, everybody likes them, they have a balanced mind and good circumstances, and even they are spinning in these cycles. It's just that the stress and their cycling is relatively subtle which means they're not gonna be interested in unhooking. So in the Buddhist cosmology, if you're in one of those angelic realms where everything's really good, you have good fortune in life, it might be relatively pleasant for you, but you won't have the proper motivation to take a clear, uh, subtle look at your situation as a living being. 
And if you're somebody who has really unfortunate conditions, it's also not so easy to practice because we're overwhelmed by the pain of our samsaric spinning. And, and the best place to do this practice is when we have some proximity, some capacity to look at how my ordinary way of being, where I'm feeling the discomfort of being a human being, but my idea of solving it is always to seek a nice experience. So I'm in that loop, but I sense this isn't going anywhere. Like we chanted, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my, like I inherit <clears throat> my intentional actions. <clears throat> One of the things that's so confusing in this work of the, you know, be bringing our awareness to the tangle, being entangled with a tangle. One of the hard things is when we open to the present moment, we're feeling the reverberations of all the choices that have been made to seek to resolve the pain in my heart through another sense experience. And that's, like I said, stressful. And so then, having done that since the beginning of time, according to the Buddha, you know, taking the wrong turn, then when I just settle in a relatively peaceful way, what do we experience? We experience the uneasiness in our hearts that is the reverberation of having chased our tail for so long. And that's very disorienting. And so what we need to hear from our spiritual elders is, hey, there is a pleasure in being mindful, but it's also at times really difficult because we're gonna feel the reverberations of all that was set in motion when we weren't so mindful. Have you noticed that in your meditation practice? it's really difficult to be present a lot of the time. And it's not about what we're doing right now. The grip, for example, we feel in the body, the tension we feel in the body, the ache or numbness we might feel in our hearts, the rage that might be burning, the uneasiness of anxiety and fear that might be reverberating deep in subtle ways. That's all the ancient reverberations from everything past. That's what that last reflection, that last remembrance that we chanted at the beginning, right? We are the owners of our karma, heirs to our karma, born out of our karma. Everything I've set in motion of that, I will have to, I am feeling right now because that's what's reverberating. The past literally doesn't exist out there somewhere behind me. So whatever the effects of the past are, they're alive in our so-called body here. When we energetically, it's all right here. For some of you who are in the class that is happening on Thursday nights, a couple times a month on Thursday nights that we're doing in collaboration with Clouds and Water Zen Center, uh, using Resma Menikim's book, My Grandmother's Hands. And it's really about undoing racialized trauma. So even something like the <clears throat> here in the West, in the United States, the history of racism and all of the harm, and not just the harm to black bodied people, but all the white bodied people who uh, express that harm, right? That lives on in us. We are, you know, all of the trauma, all of the hate, all of the fear, all of the violence, all of the receiving of violence and all of the giving of violence, that all lives in our hearts collectively. And it's not just the history of racism in the United States, you know, there's endless amounts of harm that has been done, perpetrated over the 
since the beginning of time, right? So that, there's also been kindness, there's also been love. So when we sit down, we're feeling that. Doesn't mean we're gonna feel it specifically, oh, this is that event, you know, even from our own childhood, the reverberation of what we feel in the heart, body and mind, we don't have to specifically link this feeling with that specific event. It just is part of the mis mismatch of our heart, body and mind that we feel. And so, so much of the emphasis on developing some stability of awareness, some basic uh, trust in the goodness, the love in the heart, the capacity for appreciation and forgiveness is so that we have some resilience to stay with what we feel when we sit. And then this uh, intention to be content, this, content, this intention to allow everything to move, what we're feeling in the heart, honey, you have permission to move. What we're feeling in the body, honey, you have permission to move. What we're noticing in the mind, the thinking mind, honey, you have permission to move. Right? We're really, we're trusting that this is how we disentangle from the tangle. We're there, we're intimate. Because trying to fix the tangle with, you know, with some nice experience is what causes the tangle. Trying to get out of the tangle makes the tangle. Like thinking we're somebody, if, I, if only I get something, add something, then there's no tangle, that, that adds to the tangle. Thinking I'm somebody who can get out of the tangle adds to the tangle. Being intimate with the tangle and realizing this capacity to let everything be felt, be seen, letting everything move. So we're using the pleasure of contentment, dispassion, the letting go of all self selfing. The hook, you know, another way the hook the Buddha talks about this hook is the second dart. A lot of you have heard this sutta, where when we're hurting, when we are having a more honest awareness of how it feels to be a human being, then the only thing we know do, what to do with that hurt is to think I need something or I need to get rid of something. And that's what the Buddha calls the second dart, because then that's stressful this is not okay. If I have that, or if I get rid of that, then I'll be, and we kind of put that burden on our shoulders and we feel oppressed because I'm not okay now, I need this. Oops. Okay, I'm back. I'm assuming you can hear me. I just got signed out for some reason. Everyone hear me okay? Let me just read you this uh, quote from the suttas. This is from the Buddha. And uh, first it starts with uh, an angelic being, evidently, putting a riddle to the Buddha. And this is what this angelic being says. There is a tangle within and a tangle without. The world is entangled with a tangle. About that, oh, Gotama. Gotama is the Buddha's family name. So that was one of the words people would use to um, talk to him, Gotama. About that, oh, Gotama, I ask you, who can disentangle this tangle? And so the Buddha answers in three verses. The first thing he says is, a wise practitioner established in non-harming developing the stability of awareness and wisdom, being ardent and prudent, is able to disentangle this tangle. And then the second verse, in whom lust, hate, and ignorance, right, greed, hatred, and delusion, has faded away, those influx-free awakened ones, it is in them 
that the tangle is disentangled, right? So this is uh, faded away is how the Buddha talks about this um, discernment of the happiness of dispassion. It's a fading away. Oh yeah, I could have popcorn, but I'm really appreciating the happiness of dispassion. So my need for popcorn is fading. Doesn't mean popcorn isn't experienced like it's always been experienced by me. The crunchiness, the saltiness, the butteriness, it's just what it is. But the need for it, the attachment is fading because I'm learning to appreciate a more refined and substantial happiness, which is the happiness of non-dependence. And that's the way it's like letting go happens when the heart has found a refuge that's more trustworthy than the refuge of having popcorn. And you can just, of course, substitute any sense pleasure that, you know, works for you. And then here's the last stanza where name and form, name and form cease, where name and form ceases, stops without remainder, and also impingement and perception of form. It is here this tangle is cut. So here the Buddha is pointing to really to Nibbana, which, you know, we just hear the information but it's really useful to hear the information, how the, he doesn't talk a lot about Nibbana. This is one of the places where he's talking about it in terms of name and form. So the mind, we don't really know our mind without it being entangled in name and form, right? So the mind we know is always involved in the world of name and form experience and our ideas about experience. This is being known. So Ibana is described as the mind, realizing the mind that isn't grasping in any way, name and form. So it's a mind in a sense that has been released from the, its habit of gripping and reacting to name and form. So we know when the mind's grip attachment to name and form has lessened, right? We know that experience, just like we know the experience when the grip on name and form is really intense and it hurts. We have a lot of attachment. We know that we know when it lessens and we want to have a lot of humility and interest about just following that thread, like letting the mind in a sense, die before it dies, letting, because we're dying to this grip. We're just letting that. And the way that happens is learning to appreciate the pleasure of dispassion, the pleasure of disenchantment, the peace of non-drama, the peace of selfing, really the self-centered drama is really dissipating, quieting, and just let that process of appreciating more subtle peace go where it's gonna go. Trusting it, learning to trust it all the way. So it's like nobody forces us into this place of letting go. It's a natural process of the mind beginning to do what we did during the guided sit this morning, which is, I'm going to take a half an hour and I'm going to practice keeping in mind the very real but subtle pleasure of contentedness. Just keeping it in mind, keep it in mind and just see where it goes. See how it becomes more refined, more peaceful, more healing, more trustworthy, more empty of selfing, of self-centeredness. But it's never a forced thing which can always feel, you know, we'll get pushback from the mind, like you're trying to extinguish me. I don't like that. But there isn't an extinguishing of anybody. It's just a waking up to what this is. That's really important to understand because these terms we find in Buddhism, like emptiness can really sound like somebody's trying to get rid of me and I don't like it. <laughs> you know, it's not what I signed up for. I, 
I came for stress reduction. And now they talk about, you know, the absence of self. Get away from me. <laughs> no, it's really about realizing the limitation of sense pleasure. Still, we're going to play in that world. We're going to put a sweater on when we're cold, etc. But we're going to allow for a natural withdrawing of the dependence because we see the limitations of sense pleasure. Luckily, there's another pleasure to explore. Contentment, dispassion, letting go, the peace and freedom of the absence of selfing, of self-centered drama animated by greed, hate, and delusion. We'll get taste of that in a really refined state of concentration. Craving, greed, hatred, and delusion gets really quiet, even in moments not there. And then the mind has a taste. Oh, this is the taste of freedom that the Buddha was pointing to. But the latent tendency to go back to craving, that hasn't been uprooted. So we're back in our crazy world of thinking popcorn's going to do it for us. <laughs> really nice to be with everyone this morning. And grateful that Nancy is here to lead everyone in the small groups who want to stay. I just want to mention that not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, Gabe Keller Flores and Shelly Graff, the associate director, will be leading our twice annual community practice intensive, about two weeks long, um, ending with a day long retreat on December 19th. And then next week at this time, Shelly Graff will give the Dharma talk. The following week, uh, Win Fricky will give the Dharma talk. And then, like I said, I'll be back on the 20th. Still space in the year end retreat from Sunday evening, the 27th through Thursday noon, the 31st of December. You should be able to find that on, in the weekly email and on our online calendar. Nancy is now the host. And I'll say goodbye to everyone who's still here. Enjoy the small groups. See you in a couple of weeks, everyone.